I'd like to ask you some questions. This is going to be covering some of the stuff we've talked about already. Uh, just for the benefit of people that haven't been here. Okay. Okay. And um, these are very rough notes. I had some other questions I thought. Is this, is this thing turned on? Yeah. Yeah, not so mine. He's still working on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not my thing here. I thought while he was doing that, I'd just say that. Yeah. Oh. This tape doesn't seem to be wanting to roll. Oh my god, there's an ad in here for a, a student nightclub in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> So at the end of Maui, at the Hana end, which is the least populated end, the least populated of the Hawaiian Islands, there's a general store, Sam Hasegawa's, which says in big letters on the window, nowhere near Waikiki. <laughs> and that's the whole spirit of Maui. They're so goddamn proud that they're not Honolulu or Waikiki or a tourist trap. <laughs> And yet the tourists come to Maui anyway. They just haven't built it up. Uh, yeah, it's still a jungle. Uh, I got a bunch of friends who live in Maui. I love visiting them, but I wouldn't want to live there. Who wants to have rats, uh, mongooses, and centipedes this long to contend with all the time? I think the jungle is a wonderful place to visit, but I don't want to live there. <laughs> Now, British Columbia, there's not a poisonous species at all up in that forest. Yeah, I like the I like the islands up there very much. They named an island after me. When commuting gets cheaper, I'll live in British Columbia and commute to Hollywood. No, not really. I prefer the Southern California climate. It's a little too much rain. Yeah. No, I think I'll move to Baja. Is this it? When the commuting gets cheaper. I'm at a loss to understand why this is not working. <laughs> so when did you, when and why did you imprint Marilyn Chambers? Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> what? Exactly. When and why did you imprint Marilyn Chambers as that? Oh, your personal love kind of. <laughs> <laughs> She was only imprinted for oh, three of my perfect. novels, and then she sort of faded away. It wasn't a real heavy imprint. Oh, I saw behind the green door on acid. Can I use that so question in answer? Yes, yes. yes uh, great. Mm -hmm. great. Please, everyone, catch in. What is this, anyway? Green door. Now this looks like I don't know. I, I've never seen it. <laughs> What's the one where she's like cruising around on the This is it. This is in, in Seychelles. Yeah, she's yeah. in a fancy car. She's like a rich, poor rich girl. It's a little rich girl. Right? Yeah, Turn off the sound. One movie's are better with the sound off. <laughs> and we can do the interview better that way. Okay. They do have fine music like in the films, though. <laughs> Yeah, but the dialogue is fine. <laughs> yeah, you know, use, use Beethoven 7. Yeah, that's what I want to see as a porn movie. With, with the, uh, when they make Schrodinger's cat. With you know, <laughs> uh, Beethoven? Uh, yeah, the 7th would make a good porn movie score. So would the 9th. Uh, so would the 6th, for that matter. Or the 8th, for sure, a porn movie. Okay. What is number number eight? Eight? <laughs> Do they have those behind the green door one, two, three? And so they can use a different Beethoven symphony with yeah. one of these. Oh, yeah, well, some of Mozart would go good with a porn movie, too, I think. Yeah. The late symphonies, the flute concertos. Why, why a porn movie? A porn movie should be so much better than they are. Ever read uh, Blue Movie by Terry yeah, Southern? Yeah, yeah. Great. What would happen if Stanley Kubrick made yeah. one movie? Yeah, it's so obvious that Kubrick is the model for the director. Uh huh. <laughs> I think it was dedicated to him. Yeah, it's a yeah. great Stanley. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a great book. Yeah. What's it called? Blue Movie. Terry Southern is fine. Yeah, well, that's you say that's about what would happen if uh, Kubrick took it into his head to make a really artistic porn movie to show how it should be done with all the Kubrick 
that's the that fun that they use. <laughs> it ends up, doesn't it end up never being released, but it ends up in the Vatican for private yeah, screenings the by the uh, uh, Jesuits? It suppresses the film. They managed to steal every copy. <laughs> and the end is they're showing it late at night in St. Peter's. You know, all the cardinals are going in with glinting eyes. You know. <laughs> he was out. Since Kubrick did it, he's got all the top actors and actresses in Hollywood and all these fantastic porn scenes. <laughs> everybody's everybody's fantasies acted out. <laughs> Actually, the Vatican's been this since the 30s. And they had a whole series of all the major stars in the last 40 years. See from right next to the body of Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Pieces of the wood cross, I bought one of those. <laughs> they had those for sale in the lobby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you get it all a little bit of miraculous multiplication. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. There we go. <laughs> okay. She keep it kind of small. I don't know if we're we'll wiring it up yet. Yeah, kind of. This is, yeah, this is going, this is going, uh, okay. Um. One question I do want to get cleared up, and you talk about it in your introduction to Wilhelm Reich in Hell. Uh, I need to know, it's been a burning question since I first read it. Uh, does Stim the Framagoshes, yes or no? Uh, <laughs> oh, wow. That one really came out of left field. Uh, personally, I think we should leave the Framagoshes the hell alone. Don't put no restrictions on the Framus Goshes. Leave them the hell alone. Uh, you Research Publications has uh, announced that they will be doing a book dedicated to you. Um, how is that coming along? I don't know. Every time I'm in San Francisco, I give them a call and they say we're working on it. But they do bring out books every so often, so I guess they'll bring it out eventually. I mean, they've been working on it for about two years, but they don't publish that much. I suppose they'll eventually get it to the stage of being ready for production, for publication. But you have done interviews with them? I did an interview with them, and uh, they, uh, I gave them a couple of pieces that hadn't been published before. One of them is about to come out in my new anthology, Coincidence. That's because they took so long in producing their book, I decided to stick it somewhere else. It was probably printed previously in German in a Swiss newspaper, and I wanted it published somewhere in the United States. And one will... Uh, it also has a... The, the research issue on, on me also has a quiz I invented, a conspiracy trivia quiz. I got about 99 questions about... Uh, Oh, that's Marilyn, all right. Uh, trivia uh, questions about the conspiracies of the last couple of thousand years. That should be. This fun. is the way to do an interview. <laughs> <laughs> well, we try and you know set, setting and dosing. It's all very important. Can I have some more grass? That's the way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it? Uh -uh. That's where I got the phone. Here it is. We'll edit this tape as we go. Oh no, we got it. <laughs> As I said, very important. The more important, the better. Uh, you mentioned that you have new, and I'm very excited about this, a new newsletter coming out called Trajectories. Yes. Uh, first of all, I have the address, so I'll, I'll include that. Could you, uh, well, could you tell me a little bit more about it, uh, what contributors you hope to include? Uh, most of the leading futurists in the United States we hope to get. Uh, I think we got most of them. Uh, uh, I think we'll get most of them. Um, care to drop a few names? Well, we're hoping to get Tim Leary, uh, Marilyn Ferguson, Barbara, Barbara Marx Hubbard, FMS Fendieri, John Lilly. Uh, he's one of the dubious cases. It's hard to get Lilly's attention these days. And uh, and if we can, uh, various people responsible for recent breakthroughs like Brigogine and so on. Dirk Pearson. Oh yeah, Dirk Pearson definitely. We're aiming for. And this will be coming out monthly. Uh, monthly? Daily. <laughs> 
quarterly at first. We hope to increase it to monthly after the first year. And the first issue will be coming out uh, mid to late April? That's right, mid to late April. I mean, if I had told you, like, in high school, when you were reading your first Robin Hood Tales book... I would have been so happy if you told me that. <laughs> that would be great. Mark, do you realize that in ten, you know, about ten years from now, we're going to be sitting at someone's house, smoking grass with Robin Hood and Tony Wilson, drinking beer, and you're going to be interviewing while watching a porno. <laughs> <laughs> which, was, was come, which, which came out at that time. <laughs> <laughs> you want to say, David, get some more of that stuff that you're smoking. Right? That's right. Sign me up. It's all worthwhile for me. Uh, for the benefit of the readers, could you go into a little bit of detail uh, about the brain machines that you've been discussing in, in, a, in a general sort of a way? Well, the first generation of brain machines was the biofeedback machines that monitored your brain and gave you a signal. And you tried to, uh, using various techniques that were suggested to you, whether you read in books on yoga or whatnot, you tried to get into the state that would bring the signal back. And it was much easier than doing meditation without such a machine, because the signal helped you find your way back to the right state. Uh, the second generation was when they discovered that you could get the same effect with light and sound, and the entrainment was much quicker. Instead of trying to find the state and just getting a signal when you were there, they would flash lights or sounds, lights into your eyes or sounds into your ears, and then later somebody had the obvious idea, lights in the eyes and sound in the ear at the same time. And if they're at the same frequency, the brain will follow that frequency and the brain gets entrained to go to that state. And the third generation was uh, when Mike Hercules or somebody, I'm not quite sure who, got the idea, why not send electromagnetism directly through the brain and change the brain waves immediately and put a dial on it and you can adjust it to any frequency you want. Uh, you can train people to get into desirable frequencies and you can do endless research on finding out what the hell happens at each different brain frequency because we don't know much about that yet. So Mike designed the Pulse Star, which is both a training device and a research instrument. And then a whole bunch of others came out and uh, the most complicated uh, of the lot is the uh, uh, Synchro Energizer which uses light and sound but has a computer generated program that's allegedly guaranteed to do everything every other brain machine <coughs> does and even more. I've tried it twice and I haven't found it that far superior to other machines. Where it excels is in price at $7,000. Most of the machines in this field run from 200 to 500. Uh, I don't mean to put it down. I've only tried it twice. Maybe there are things that make it worth 7,000. Uh, the NeuroPep is a very good light and sound machine because it has an endless series of tapes. They're creating new ones all the time. And every yeah. time something is learned about a new frequency, they make a new tape for that. And so you got an endless series of light and sound shows, each of which adjusts your brain to some rhythm which is known to produce certain effects on the body. And uh, you can be having classic light shows and great music and training your brain at the same time. I'm very fond of the NeuroPep. Now, you were involved with the creation of that? No, I just happened to know the guy who invented it. I didn't have any... Uh, I studied electrical engineering 35 years ago, but I have trouble remembering Ohm's Law. <laughs> so I put it on the blackboard today. Somebody said it was wrong, and I had a few moments of serious doubt before I convinced myself I did get it right. I... Uh -uh. I think I got it wrong. No, I think it's current, <laughs> or uh, voltage times frequency equals current. I think that's it. No, I'm pretty sure it's E okay. equals IR. Current equals, uh, uh, voltage equals current times resistance. Yeah, it's been a long time. Yeah, well, it's been a longer time for me, but I think I do remember that one. Oh, uh, on another topic, just uh, the, two, the two statements that you had up there, um, 
the next the next statement will be true and the following the previous statement was false mm -hmm. and you said that the first was incomplete and that the second was strange loop a strange mm -hmm. loop well, I was giving that, that some thought, and I think you can definitely state that the second one is false, because what it is saying is that the previous statement was false, whereas the previous statement was not false, it was incorrect. <laughs> it's incomplete. <laughs> it depends on whether you consider the two statements independently or collectively. Right, that's if true. If you consider them independently, that arises. If you consider them collectively, you're in a strange loop. Well, it you're goes also around and around contradicting itself forever. Even the other way, you're still in a strange loop because then the first portion would not be incomplete because it was connected to the <laughs> second. <laughs> then there's Bertrand Russell's, if I can remember correctly, the number that requires more than 19 syllables to define it. If I said that correctly, it has 19 syllables, so it defined the number, and yet the definition is that it requires more than 19 syllables to define that number. <laughs> <laughs> Russell had a lot of fun with mathematics. He has a, he has a mathematical proof using six-dimensional geom six geometry that uh, the universe is outside of my empirical or sensual head, but it's inside my theoretical head, which is necessary, which is a necessary construct for any theory of perception that doesn't run into contradictions. So in order to avoid contradictions in the theory of perception, according to Russell, I've got to accept the six-dimensional geometry in which I have two heads, one empirical and findable in space-time, and one and the other one Ray Milan, and the other one includes <laughs> all space-time. <laughs> Now, I think that other head is God, but Russell <laughs> claimed career. to be an agnostic, so he wouldn't admit it was God. <coughs> oh, let's see. Oh, you've mentioned... Um, is this the famous pool table sequence? Yes, it is. Ah. Um, well, we may have a little trouble concentrating on the questions <laughs> for a few minutes. Just switch just put it on to, to one to give it a shot at the moon answer. Yeah, if you want the boot in hand, just flip the uh, switch to one. So it's a tape loop. It's not. Uh, it's not a straight reel to play. It's a straight loop. Uh, oh, it's a, yeah. I almost said a strange loop. Ha! Did have a tape loop? Wow. Thank you. Well, this goes great with bait, though. <laughs> oh, you had mentioned um, you would like to write a straight detective novel. Mm -hmm. Well, I did once. The Masks of the Illuminati. Only I kept the reader guessing all through it whether it was a straight detective novel or a not cult novel. <coughs> Have you read any of uh, Jim Thompson? No. No. Recommended. Ex and a very good writer. Mm -hmm. um, moving right along. Definitely. Read Jim Thompson. He's read great. Jim Thompson. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I may imprint Marilyn Chambers again. Good <laughs> <laughs> <Keep> coming, Candy. <coughs> it was Jimmy Swagger's name, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> well, did he watch me on Chambers on that side? He watched <laughs> Tracy Lords on it. Oh, that's right. But who has it? I've watched Tracy Lords on it. <laughs> <laughs> I say proudly. <laughs> Well, I'm looking forward to the new R-rated Tracy Lord's remake of Not of This Earth. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> She's 18 now. She can make a legitimate film. I think Dan Aykroyd is a straight man. I'm still trying to figure out the meaning of no wife, no horse, no mustache. Uh, a lot of people are. <laughs> a lot of people have. A lot of people do know the answer. Uh, there, there are thousands of jokes in my books with the uh, time fuses on them. Uh, sometimes you get, it takes a year. Sometimes it takes five years. Sometimes you never find out the answer. Ulysses is full of jokes like that too. And Ulysses was a major influence on me. I'm not giving away any of the jokes. It's up to everybody to find the answer in their own good time and have a good laugh when they find it. Well, at least I have the mustache. <laughs>
Now, you were involved with the L5 Society at one point, uh, according to one or more uh, biographies. I had heard that you were no longer involved with them. Uh, is this due to some stance they're taking as far as politically or ideologically? Well, I got bored with the mammalian politics and the Hellfire Society and all the domesticated primates fighting for their turf in the outer space. And uh, I got more interested in just promoting space migration in my own way and, and wherever I could rather than being involved in the of the ideological and metaphysical hair-splitting that was going on in the L5 society. Uh, I don't believe any politics is right or wrong. I think they're all guesswork. And, and if they get, become successful at all, it's because they become opportunistic and lost all their principles. If they keep their principles, they're never successful. So I forgot the whole area is a waste of intellect. As Nietzsche said, the only role for the intellectual in politics is as a clown. <laughs> like Wavy Gravy, who runs nobody for president every year. Now, yeah, that's, that's, that's an intelligent <laughs> approach to politics. Um, since you are now li living here in the States, uh, any concerns about the upcoming election? Or is that a given, being a citizen of the United States at this point? <coughs> I think I'm still a resident of Ireland. I'm a citizen of the United States, but a resident of Ireland for a while mm -hmm. yet. My, citizen, my residency doesn't expire uh, until April, and I'm going back to Ireland in May. <coughs> for all I know, I may be able to renew it. Well, they treat writers very well there. Uh, yes, uh, Charlie Hoey uh, in 1968 decided to make up for all the mistreatment Ireland has notoriously given to our greatest writers in the last hundred years by doing something uh, to benefit writers. It's a uh, sad but typically Irish irony that two years later Charlie Hoey was indicted for running guns for the IRA. He was, however, acquitted. And uh, I have uh, asked every journalist in Dublin that I've gotten to know since journalists are claimed to know everything, whether they can print it or not, uh, I've asked every journalist in Dublin that I could get to open up to me, do you think Charlie was innocent or was he really running guns for the IRA? And every one of them has given me the same answer. He was running guns for the IRA. The jury found him not guilty because they knew everybody else in the government was doing it too. And they said, why should we make a scapegoat out of Charlie? So that's a, that's a typical Irish complexity. No, Things just, seem much simpler over here, somehow. Are you getting distracted? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes and no, and yes again. Oh, now this is a question. Um, do you, and this is it. Uh, does this synchronous does this synchronicity stuff ever get annoying to you? I know it does to me. At points. <laughs> no, I've never found it annoying. Uh, a couple of times, I've uh, I've almost been frightened by it. Uh, there was uh, one time in uh, Dublin when I was uh, working on an article on synchronicity in Joyce, uh, which was published in Semiotext magazine under the name, title Coincidence. Which is great, and everyone should buy it. Well, thank you. <laughs> While I was working on that, I went out for a walk one afternoon, and every license plate I saw I had a number that was one of the key numbers in the article I was writing, and it was not one but the second one, and the third one, and the fourth one, and the fifth one, and the sixth one, and I began to think, this is too, this is too much synchronicity even for me. And I remember the story about the guy at the Young Institute, when they were having a run like that. He kept saying, I don't understand, and Jung kept saying, it's synchronicity. And finally, he, he burst out, and uh, when it got even worse, he said, what the hell do you, what does this synchronicity really mean? 
And Jung said, okay, it's demons. <laughs> it's almost as good as turtles, turtles, it's turtles. Yeah. It's pretty much it's so much you get more music. It's not gonna get any more yeah. music. What shot should we come in soon? <laughs> I'm sorry. The wet shot should be <laughs> <laughs> uh -uh. Well, I see why the pool table sequences become so renowned in folklore. <laughs> There's a girl I can take a fair amount of abuse. Have you seen her lately? Uh-uh. Uh-uh, okay. Yeah. What do you mean, okay. What do you mean, have I seen her She was interviewed in Jones Quarterly about four months ago. She comes out for Soldier of Fortune conventions. Uh, Which I think is great. <laughs> <laughs> I saw an interview with her recently. She's starting her own company, Marilyn Chambers Productions. All hardcore. She says she's going to make it more artistic and respectable than ever. There's a, there's a woman now that's touring. Her name's Candida Royale. Have you ever seen any of her movies? No. Yeah, wh what's the name of that group? Film production. Oh yeah, I've yeah. seen two uh, half-hour films by them. Yeah, I think they're great. They were excellent. <laughs> they, they were artistic yeah. and beautiful and mm -hmm. uh, and very moving and very very sexy. Yeah. 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 She was like an ex-porn actress, and now she just said, "Now I said she wanted to do it the way it should have been done." Oh well, she God, did. she's on the right track. Yeah. <laughs> Until the great Stanley K follows Terry Southern's advice, she's doing like damn well in, in the interim. Another very good porn film was directed by a woman, so that was China Girl. And that's Haven. That's a really quite good. It's Not really perfect, but quite good. The last one I saw, everyone was like, it was a. They, this couple met in a bookstore and they each got the same book and the, the metaphysical aspect of it was they each read a different thing in the book <laughs> <laughs> it's like oh I don't you know, they, they meet later at the end and said I really like the scene it's like wait a minute I read the whole book I didn't see that scene the other one's like yeah I read the whole scene <laughs> oh we're supposed to be doing an interview oh yes oh. <laughs> like I said, uh, is, she, is she in Rome now? we're all in Rome now <laughs> <laughs> Look, Robert Angel. That's, that's, is that, I bet that was Dennis, actually. I think it's Cleveland. <laughs> I'm fascinated uh, with the image of Robert Anton Wilson and Bill Dick in the same room. Uh, <laughs> Talk a little bit about that. You met him prior to his uh, contact? No, I met him after uh, his uh, experience. Uh, I met him at a science fiction convention in Santa Rosa. And he was very curious about Cosmic Trigger and they wanted to ask me a lot of questions about uh, the more outre experiences reported there. And uh, later on, some people who knew Phil and also knew me told me that Phil was very worried about his sanity at that point. And thinking over his questions, I realized he was trying to decide whether I was sane or not. His attitude was, if I was sane, then he was sane. And if I was crazy, then he really had to be worried too because he was crazy the same way I am. And it was a very interesting conversation all around, although it took a couple of years for me to really get into focus what we were talking about. <laughs> we're both agnostics. 
He was an agnostic as much as I am. He was an agnostic with a strong emotional pull to uh, mystical Christianity. Which came out <coughs> in his later writings more and more clearly. Yes. I'm an agnostic with a strong pull toward uh, a Buddhist detachment. Uh, well, you've, you've heard L.A. Rollins' uh, definition of an agnostic? Uh, no, his it's better than Marx's. Luke, uh, in his uh, Lucifer's lexicon, it's uh, an agnostic is a God-fearing atheist. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason I'm an agnostic is I'm not smart enough to be an atheist. <laughs> I'm not as smart as Rollins, for instance. I lived in Ireland for six years, and I haven't figured out Ireland yet. I haven't figured out the ecology, why they have palm trees in a, such a northern climate where it's colder than any part of the United States most of the year. I haven't figured out the politics. I can't tell Fianna Foyle from Fine Gael, and I understand most of the Irish can't either. I know Fianna Foyle is suspected of supporting the IRA, although they always deny it. I, I know nobody in Ireland will admit supporting the IRA, but somebody moves the guns from the Kerry coast up to Northern Ireland in a regular route. Now that must and there are IRA, pro IRA graffiti all over every big town in Ireland and in the little villages too, but nobody will admit supporting them. I can, I, I, there's so much about Ireland I can't figure out after six years, and it's such a small part of the earth, and to try to figure out the whole fucking universe uh, it's beyond me, and uh, I admire people like Rollins and Thomas Aquinas got it all who figured it out, but I'm not that smart. I got a moderate IQ, and I'm only 56 years old. Give me another 200 years, maybe I'll have some real data to work on. You've been contributing to High Frontiers and the Reality Hackers newsletter, is that correct? Uh, I haven't knowingly been contributing to the Reality Hackers newsletter, but uh, quite a few people picked up articles of mine without uh, having the courtesy either to pay me or even to notify me that they're doing it. As a Buddhist, I forgive them. As a Christian, I know they'll burn in hell for it. <laughs> Thank God I'm not a Christian most of the time. <clears throat> well, I have not seen a copy. I had heard that you had an article in there. Is that correct? In High Frontiers? Yeah, yeah. I had a couple of articles in there. They have the courtesy to send me sample copies whenever they rip off one of my articles. They never paid me anything. They just rip off articles of mine from various places and reprint them. But uh, since they have the courtesy to send me a sample copy, I figure they, they're trying to be gentlemen as far as they can understand the concept. Well, the reason I ask is um, I'm fairly unfamiliar with the current, what, it, what judging from those publications, <coughs> appears to be a new uh, chemical underground of uh, intelligence increased drugs, memory enhancers, uh, mm -hmm. psychotropics of various kinds. Uh, can you bring us up to date on that? Are you familiar with that? Yes, Any? the, uh, both the legal and illegal laboratories have been producing copious uh, amounts of uh, different designer drugs to produce uh, different specified effects. And they're getting more and more precise and more and more versatile. And these drugs are appearing in the underground uh, fair, so far fairly undiluted, although there are some horror stories going around suggesting some rip-off artists have moved in and are selling all sorts of shit under the names of good drugs. Uh, I'm not going to name any of the interesting drugs because uh, 
it is in the hands of the criminal element now, and I don't want to encourage them. But if I name any of the ones that aren't illegal yet, this might fall under the eyes of the FDA, and they'll make it illegal and make the situation even more fucked up and crazy than it is already. These things should be used in scientific research, and as they prove safe, they should be administered to any adult who wants to try them. That's been my opinion since the 60s, and I've seen no reason to change it. It's obvious that consciousness alters as brain chemistry alters. We've got evidence for that, not only from drug research, but from hypnosis, from all sorts of areas of brain research, from the research on how the brain changes with the new brain tuning machines. Uh, from a thousand directions, we've got all this evidence that consciousness uh, has a chemical aspect, and when you alter the chemistry, consciousness changes in dramatic ways, and new realities are perceived and new reality tunnels. And this is the most important, this is as important in our century as the Copernican Revolution was in his time, and it's being persecuted by exactly the same methods and driven underground in the same way we've got a new inquisition and a new outlaw scholar community who do scientific reports and don't publish them, pass them on to one another under the table, and it's uh, it's like scholars in England getting uh, notifications of what Galileo was doing in Rome uh, by an invisible ink because it can't get through the censors if they could read it. Uh, it's all very absurd, uh, but a great deal of knowledge is being gained about the brain and some, in some future time when there's more rationality, uh, we will all profit from these discoveries. Meanwhile, only the, those who are both lucky and judicious will profit from them. <laughs> Naturally, when you start talking about brain change, um, you lean toward the other aspect of it. <clears throat> what are your concerns as far as the use of uh, entrainment techniques and these various techniques for less than um, or other than, lack of a better word, positive uses, uh, either by the government or individuals. <clears throat> Ever since I started talking about the new brain hardware, people have been asking me about dangerous side effects, and I've been, uh, nobody's come up with any very plausible suggestions about what they may be. I've been uh, searching my imagination the best I can come up with is that they can eventually find a way using lasers perhaps to project brain frequencies at a distance. And with the improvements in computers and uh, servo mechanisms and whatnot, you can point, pinpoint that rather precisely. So the point will come when you can aim a beam at somebody's brain from across the street. They don't even know you're doing it. You can be in another apartment and uh, provoke their brain to hallucinate. But, other but than I that, don't see to be, to be I don't see how you can uh, uh, program what they're going to hallucinate. Uh, that'll take another 50 years of brain research at least. Well, you can right. provoke them to hallucinate, but the, uh, what they're going to hallucinate, I don't think you can control. I don't think this <coughs> explains UFO abduction, abduction cases, although Jacques Vallée has suggested something like this might explain those cases. I, I, we don't have, I don't see how that can be done that precisely. You can get them to hallucinate. They may hallucinate the uh, Marilyn Chambers films or uh, the cosmic birth process or their own birth over and over, just as likely as they hallucinate little dwarfs coming out of a saucer and conducting experiments on them. Any concern as to government regulation? 
these devices. <coughs> Well, I'll try to speak pragmatically. I don't think they're going to be outlawed because they, they've been found useful by a, lo a large enough percentage of the AMA that they're not going to disappear from hospitals overnight or by act of Congress. The, the AMA does, want, does like them to that extent. Now, uh, what's likely to happen, uh, the most likely interference with uh, access will be that it will be declared an AMA monopoly and you can't get a machine without a doctor's prescription. That is possible, but I'm not at all sure it has to happen just because stupid things like that have happened in the past doesn't mean they have to happen again. If enough people are informed about the issue, we have a chance that uh, the stupid uh, alternative will not be the necessi necessary alternative this time around. Have you read uh, Norman Spin Spinrad's new book, uh, Little Heroes? I'm sorry to say I haven't. Oh, in that he um, makes quite a bit of reference to people who have been, this is set a few years in the future, who have been using uh, various brain change machines. Um, and some of these people have been damaged by defective machines. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> now you've stated that you haven't found any negative effects with the machines that you've worked with, correct? Mm -hmm. It's possible. Uh, the Murphy factor cannot be overlooked. Uh, I don't see that. I don't see that as a good excuse for banning this research or for preventing uh, investigators to have access to it. Uh, the the attitude that something might prove to be dangerous to some people, therefore we must forbid it forever, uh, seems absolutely medieval to me. We only make progress by taking risks. I'm not afraid to take risks. I think a cowardly society is a society on its uh, way to decadence and total collapse. Every, every growing society is a society of uh, uh, gamblers, risk takers, uh, visionaries, utopians, and uh, uh, people who are willing to go way out on a limb get nothing but conservatives who are afraid of taking a chance. You've got a dying society. Now you've mentioned, you mentioned in the seminar the Pacific Rim culture. Mm -hmm. Now where is that from? Who's uh, several people have observed this. I think the name the Pacific Rim is from the anthropologist William Irwin Thompson. But many, many uh, current social scientists have descri described this. Well, uh, James Michener described it in a novel about 20 uh, years ago called Hawaii. He talked about the emergence of this new culture. It's, uh, it's uh, in Japan and uh, uh, to some extent Hong Kong and Australia and uh, California, uh, Oregon, Washington State, uh, uh, British Columbia, Alaska and it's moving inland. There are very strong aspects of it in Boulder, Colorado, and parts, I'm beginning to suspect, in parts of Arizona. And, uh, and there are aspects of it even in Texas. Uh, Tim Leary thinks it extends across the Sun Belt. So we're talking a fairly good piece of ground here. Uh, we're talking about the richest part of the earth with the greatest number of Nobel Prize winners living in it. But don't move to Arizona, folks. You'll hate it. <laughs> <laughs> There's too much traffic. Don't come here. Local zone only. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
here, here. You just saw um, James Houston come to death. Um, That's John Houston. I'm sorry. Here, James Watson. <laughs> Indeed. Um, care to give us a short review? It seems so meaningless now. <laughs> <laughs> you saw um, John Houston's movie, The Dead. Um, <coughs> would you like to give us a short review of it? Did you enjoy it? Was it faithful to the book? Four stars? Oh, I'd give it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think in certain rhythmic uh, uh,